Good afternoon, everybody. Hope everybody is well. Um, I want to share a word with you guys. It's super important. It's something I've probably posted about, talked about before. Um, but I'm really getting to the thick of it because of a book I'm reading right now. It's called Ecclesia by Ed Silvoso, if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. And uh, this is a very, very important book that will help the church as we know it uh, in 2022 get back to its roots, its DNA. If we feel like, oh, the church looks like it's losing its power, its influence, it's because it has in a lot of ways, but that's only because we have gone backwards. Uh, we've actually lost the way uh, of Jesus. We've lost the way that Jesus called us to of how we're supposed to live out being the church. And we've gone backwards. Which means, and here's, and here's what I mean by it, once upon a time, once upon a time we had, uh, you know, temples and synagogues. In fact, of course, we know there are still temples and synagogues. But temples and synagogues, these holy places where uh, the Israelites worshipped, the Jews worshipped their God. Obviously, we know that Solomon built you know, the temple, um, and you've got all the different meeting places in there. And so we know that we go to these, we went to a place once upon a time, we had to travel to an actual like building, a structure to access the presence of God in order to worship God, in order to be in his presence. This is how it was for a long time. Or you think about like the Ark of the Covenant, right? Um, this is the way it was. Praise God that we were not left to that. It's really awesome that because of what Christ has done by dying on the cross, by being rose uh, or by rising up again, by ascending to be with the Father and then leaving us with the Holy Spirit that came at Pentecost and now we are all the temples. Like it's an amazing mystery. We are all the temples filled with the Holy Spirit. Guys, this is so huge because we have to understand like it's not that we have to go anywhere anymore there's not a particular location there's not a building we go to be in the presence of god as i'm sitting and standing and not standing as i'm sitting in my car right now i'm in the presence of god like i have the holy spirit in me right now i don't have to travel anywhere he is here right now uh even as i speak to you and so this is this is really 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 important when jesus and this is what ed talks about in his book ecclesia so so Jesus chooses to use the term church, ecclesia in the Greek. And what's so fascinating is that he didn't choose to use the term temple and synagogue, the terms that were already relative to the day. People already knew what those were, that's for sure, these holy places of worship. He didn't use a particular static building, because that's what those were. Those were static buildings where people came and they gathered and they met, okay? But he didn't use that term. Now, we know that Jesus used the term church three times in Scripture. Why? If it was supposed to be so important, if he, if he said that the, you know, that the gates of hell will not even be able to prevail against it, why, why would he only use the term three times from what we have recorded in Scripture? It's because it wasn't a new term. This was not some... A uh, brand new term that he came up with, that he created, that he needed to explain, even to his disciples. This was a term that already existed in Roman culture. This was a term that referred to an institution that was already um, pervasive in just the common marketplace. Okay, uh, a group of people who were all over the place, just kind of infused in in Roman culture. It wasn't a static, a static building. It was a fluid, mobilized assembling of people. And Jesus, knowing this term that was in Roman culture, he chose to use it. Now, of course, he threw a big capital E on instead of a small E when talking about the Ecclesia because of how just sacred and important his church would be. So big E, Ecclesia. But you have to realize, like, he used this term because he knew that if the church was going to catch fire and just be planted all over Asia Minor by Paul and other apostles and who we read about in Scripture in the New Testament. 
if it was going to have such a massive influence over the world around it, then it was going to have to be mobile. It could not be just static. It could not just be complacent and stagnant in one place. It was going to have to be everywhere. Now, that's not to say that there won't, there wouldn't be static uh, particular places where these uh, saints who are coming together to worship and assemble, you know, it's not to say that they wouldn't meet together. Of course, they would have to meet in people's homes and they'd be, you know, worshiping over meals and things of that nature. So, you know, and of course you have the Church of Corinth, the Church of um, Thessalonica, the Church of Ephesus, you know, so on and so forth. So, of course, you're going to have in every different town, you're going to have these particular, um, you know, you got the body of believers who live in this whole entire town. And then everyone's always going to have your meeting spots, uh, the meeting locations where the believers will get together and meet, you know, for the partaking in the Lord's Supper um, and this, this and that. But again, the idea is that like, but the church was always everywhere. The church was always out and about in the marketplace and the different places of employment, um, everywhere, spread out at all times. Uh, and so this is so, so, so important because the church of America has in fact gone backwards. And here's why we have put the large emphasis of what the church is back to a, an outdated reality that no longer is a part of the new covenant. Okay. We say the phrase go to church. I'm very passionate about this. And I think rightfully so, because that, that doesn't actually make any logical biblical sense to go to church. To say that we go to church is to say, like, historically speaking, we're going to temple. We are going to synagogue, okay? Which back then would have been fine. But that's before Jesus brought in the new era of the church, this mobilized people. And so we don't go to temple anymore. We don't go to the synagogue anymore and just sit in our exclusive uh, fixed building. It doesn't work that way anymore. That's not what Jesus intended. So when we say we're going to church, what else are we inferring besides, oh yeah, we're that church, the place called the church, we're going there. Now that's not to say that there isn't an actual place where we go and meet and worship. So on Sundays, my wife knows, I like to say to my boys in the morning, hey, we're getting ready to go to worship because that's what we're going to do. We're going to worship with the saints, with other believers at a particular location. But it's not that we're worshiping at the church because the church is a people. We're worshiping with the church. We need to, we need to uh, kind of play with the semantics here. And it's not for something that I want to be so dogmatic about. Um, but at the same time, I actually really think that this is affecting our mind and the, and the way that we process the word church. What does it mean to be the church? If we've lost our power and influence and authority that we have in Christ's name as the church, maybe that we do need to think about changing the, the way we speak, the, the vernacular, the semantics of it all, because by using that language over and over, over centuries and generations, going to church, going to church, going to church, we have in fact made it, we've brought it back to this old historic outdated way of doing things that Jesus was trying to eradicate and get rid of because he knew it would lose its power and influence by just being the static building. Whereas Jesus is like, no, I'm going to mobilize my people, mobilize the church to go out into all the common places, be in the world and not of it, and have uh, an incredible influence by speaking the truth and love to all men everywhere all the time. How much influence are you gonna have when you meet for one week, once a week, for one an hour, maybe two hours if you're lucky, maybe an hour and a half if you're lucky, honestly, these days. What kind of influence in the community you're gonna have? Well, not much, why? Well, because you're meeting just in-house for worship, which again is needed. We worship together, we hear the word, we get encouraged, we have a place to just lay down our, pur our burdens, burdens, lay down our burden, I almost did it again, lay down our burdens, uh, to have, uh, you know, come all ye who are weary and heavy laden. Like we get to come and just like, let that stuff go, have other saints encourage us. I mean, Sundays are awesome. Sundays are a great day of the week because we know that there's a time we're looking forward to, to worship with like-minded believers. It is a blessing. But if you are doing that inside a static building and within four walls, you're in the community, but now you've almost made yourself not of the community. Uh, well, you're not supposed to be of the community, but now you're like set apart from the community, if you if you catch my drift. 
So now you're not really a part of the community because you're having this exclusive gathering, which is fine, but how in the world is the community going to be impacted by that gathering? Well, the hope is, is that people are being so encouraged and equipped, the saints are supposed to be encouraged and equipped and empowered by the word, by gathering, by fellowship, by truth. That's supposed to happen during those corporate worship gatherings so that all the saints who are hearing that, partaking in that, are being participants in that worship service. Now they're supposed to go Monday through Saturday and be the light of the world. And that should be the mentality. Uh, and we should also be not just gathering with the saints on a Sunday to, in order to be equipped and empowered and encouraged like that, but that should be like throughout the week, through home groups, community groups, Bible studies, whatever you want to call them, service projects, coffee dates, like whatever it is, continually meet with the saints throughout the week so that you are constantly encouraged, admonished, and challenged to go out and love your neighbors as yourself, especially the unbelieving neighbors and the lost. So the influence and power that we'll have is when we're actually out in the community, when we're actually serving, when we're actually loving on people, when we're actually evangelizing and sharing the truth of the gospel, when on a daily basis at our places of employment and work, we're being very, 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 very faithful to be bold in our truth, to be bold in our sacrificial love, to just be faithful to be living out the fruits of the Spirit. That's what should catch people off guard to some extent. They should notice the way we live, the way we conduct ourselves, the words of our mouths, and they should notice something about us. Okay, then that's when the real power and influence come with every single saint lives out their faith individually, their life with Jesus, living that out strongly and boldly, um, and just practically speaking, so that the whole world would know that Jesus is God and that He's our Savior and that He's come for, for, the, uh, for the forgiveness of sins. See how that works and see how we've gone backwards and we've actually regressed by going away from this new era that Jesus tried to usher in by a mobilized people and by using terms like go to church. By thinking that church is a thing we can do online. So many things uh, I think we've dug ourselves a very, very, very large hole in and now we need to get up out of that hole um, and get out of there and get back on the path that Jesus tried to pave for us. He tried to pave a way for us to um, do things differently. Um, and so my heart church is for that. Uh, it's for us to recognize this, that we can so easily go backwards. We can so easily step back into the old ways of doing things. Um, but it's like it's like Christians who start living by man's traditions and the law all over again instead of living by grace. You're just going to have your fruit choked up by that. And I believe that the church of America has had good, good fruit choked up because we're living by an old, abolished way of doing things. Like a system that's supposed to be done away with and eradicated. It was supposed to be a new way now. We're supposed to be mobilized. We're not supposed to be some static... Uh, gathering place and so um, my encouragement for all of us is just to think about the words we use think about the phrases you use um, let that be a conversation between you and Jesus uh, about whether that's actually accurate so you're not speaking lies over yourself we want to be speaking truth over ourselves so be careful with the words you speak think about what the Ecclesia is get that book um, I'm still going through it Ecclesia by Ed Silvoso it's a red book You'll know it when you look at the cover and it's red. Um, it, it, these are just great things to really challenge us, uh, to make us examine where we're at in the faith. Are we actually faithfully living out the church that Jesus had intended? Um, because that's obviously our, our, should be our heart's motive, is to live out God's will. We all want to say, like, God, we want to do your will. So let's make sure that we're actually living out God's will as far as what his plans are for us as the church. We need to know what it means to be the church. Uh, and we need to challenge. Here's what I think. I think we got on this path because I think we went many, many generations without anybody, pastors, Christians, lay persons of any kind, without anybody really challenging what have we turned the word church into. I think it has been unchallenged for so long. We're going through the motions. We've been doing this for generation to generation. No one's even questioning it anymore. 
And then you start to find yourself with other fellow believers for the first time really wondering like, wait a second. You know what I mean? Like those moments in church history when reform has happened have been very, very powerful moments for the church. In order for the church to quote unquote regain its power, because it's not about having that kind of power. It's not about having abusive power. It's not about having power over other people. I'm talking about the power and authority of transformation that comes by Jesus alone, amen? And when that kind of power and authority of Jesus by his spirit comes back into our hearts and our minds and then we faithfully live that out, we will see people being saved daily, like it says in the letter of Acts. We'll see that happen again when we return to the DNA of who the church is supposed to be in the first place. I hope that makes sense. Um, I hope that this is an encouragement to you. I truly, truly, truly believe if every believer was faithful to take a good hard look at this, to take a good hard look and study and research on the whole letter of Acts, the word Ecclesia, because Lord knows I didn't really even know what the history of this word was until I read this book. If we all really got into this together, individually, collectively, I think we would start to challenge things and we would see really healthy reform come to the church, realizing truly what God's will was all along for who we were meant to be. So I pray that over ourselves that we would all figure that out um, that God would enlighten us, that there would be a spiritual awakening in our hearts, returning to what he was trying to usher in, the new era of the church. I pray that we all return to that. Love you guys, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.